In this video, I will share an easy recipe to help a neurologist do a better job of caring for people impacted by MS. If you'd like to learn more, don't turn away because that starts right now. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. I recently published an article in a journal called Neurology Live. It was entitled, Treating MS, a Simplified Strategy to Boost Patient and Provider Satisfaction. And in this article, I outline an easy to apply rubric or recipe for how I think a neurologist can up their game in caring for people with MS. And I wanted to share what I wrote here with you. Now, I'll make sure to include a link to that article down in the description below in case you'd actually like to read it. But what I plan to do over the next two videos is to outline for you the salient points from that article. It would be amazing to me if you shared this video with your neurologist, keeping in mind that the goal is to help someone with MS be the most awesome version of them possible despite having the disease. And let's discuss how I think we can do that. In the article, I share with doctors my desire for patients to be four for four in their fight against MS. I explained that being four for four in your fight includes number one, taking a disease modifying therapy and make sure it's working. Number two, avoiding tobacco smoke. Number three, exercising as part of your lifestyle. And number four, eating clean and supplementing low levels of vitamin D. This video will focus on the first element, taking uh, the most effective DMT that you're comfortable with and making sure it's working. So let's discuss how I think a neurologist can best do that. But first, the question of the day. How frequently should people with MS have a brain MRI scan? Is the answer one, only at time of diagnosis, two, only if new symptoms occur, three, every year, or four, every two years? Jot down your response and stay tuned to the end of this video to find out the correct answer. Step one in my four part rubric is to help the person with MS start the most effective disease modifying therapy they're comfortable with and then to monitor and make sure it's working. And quite honestly, that's a lot of work. We start off, however, by throwing out the escalation model. It is a flawed model that leads bad places. And any of you that follow my channel know that I'm very passionate about this. I'll throw a link up above to a video I did explaining why I dislike the escalation model. In brief, it allows people with MS to develop brain damage, spinal cord damage, which is often irreversible, before we're allowed to escalate to a drug that works better. And that doesn't make any sense. We can do so much better for the person in the short term and in the long term by starting them on the most effective therapy that they're comfortable with. It is not the right of the provider to act paternalistic and to inform you of what your risk benefit is. It's not our body. It's not our brain. It's your body and your brain. And it's our ethical responsibility to teach you, to educate you about the risks of untreated MS, of the risks of under-treated MS, in other words, treating but not adequately. And then we can teach you the benefit risk of a given disease-modifying therapy placed inside the context of the risk of the disease. Working as a team, we can game out what is the most effective drug that you're comfortable with, and then we can begin the process of monitoring to see how it works. So now let's turn our attention to how do we monitor once you've started a drug. Once the person with MS has started on the most effective drug they're comfortable with, we have to monitor to make sure it's working. And really, we monitor in three ways. Number one is listening to what they tell us. Number two is to do neurological examinations to look for change on their neuro exam. And number three is to review MRI imaging of brain and spinal cord. And I'd like to talk briefly about each one of those things. The art of medicine involves talking. And I think each time the person with MS goes to the provider, there needs to be a robust conversation about how they're doing. Not a cocktail party, hey, are you okay? Great, thanks a lot, bye. That's not what I'm talking about. And here's a list of five questions I think we should ask each patient every visit. Number one, are you having any difficulties tolerating your disease-modifying therapy? In other words, how much does it suck to have to inject yourself or take a pill? 
Number two, everybody misses medicines. I certainly do. On average, how many pills are you missing in a given week? Number three, since we last saw you in clinic, have you developed any new neurological symptoms? Number four, have any of your old neurological symptoms gotten any worse? And lastly, since we last saw you, have any symptoms gotten better? The second piece to monitoring is to examine the patient. And I have an entire playlist where I broke down all the aspects of the formal neurological examination. So I'll throw a link up to that playlist in case you wanted to really decode the neuro exam. But for this video and in the article, I really focus on two elements that I think are best practices when doing an exam with someone with MS. The first one is if the person is ambulatory, so if the person with MS can walk, we need to do a timed 25 foot walk every single visit. A timed 25 foot walk has been studied and a 20% change in the time is both clinically and statistically significant. I think I even have a video on how to do a timed 25 foot walk, so I'll throw a link up to that one as well. A second key exam piece is to look into cognition. And my favorite way of doing this is to administer a paper and pencil test called the symbol digit modality test. Now this takes 90 seconds, it's a matching quiz, and it's exquisitely sensitive for picking up change with thinking and memory. A 20% change, or even a change of four points on this test, is actionable. And I think it gives us significant insight to the workings of thinking and memory when assessing someone with MS. So this is the second element that I think should be done with each patient each visit. The third element to monitoring a person with MS is to obtain neuroimaging, or MRIs. And I believe strongly that it's a best practice to obtain an MRI of the brain once a year. I want the neurologist to pull that scan up on the computer and put it up side by side with the scan from last year. And then you're gonna look at each image together and compare. And you're looking to see if there's any new bright spots or any old bright spots that got bigger. You're looking to see if there's any new black holes and if there's any new contrast enhancing lesions. You also can do a visual comparison of brain volume loss. I have a lot of videos on the channel about MRI, so I'll throw a playlist up above uh, which links to many of those videos on MRI in case you would like to learn more. I also believe that it's a best practice to obtain MRIs of the cervical spine. We certainly want to do this at the time of diagnosis. And then, I don't repeat the cervical spine every year. I tend to get the cervical spine every other year. And so again, when you get a C-spine MRI, you wanna compare it to the last one that you obtained and look through each image to see if there's any new or enlarged lesions. Okay, so we've started the person with MS on the most effective therapy that they're comfortable with. And now we're monitoring that therapy by listening to what they tell us, by examining them, and by following serial MRI scans. So what happens if we find something bad? What do we do? And I wanna introduce the term breakthrough disease. So if you're on an oral birth control pill and you get pregnant, it didn't work. You had breakthrough disease. And if you're taking an MS disease modifying therapy and you have a new attack or a new spot on MRI, it didn't work. That's breakthrough disease activity. And it's my belief that when you're on a therapy and you have an attack, or when you're on a therapy and you have a new MRI spot, that's actionable. I think it should result in a conversation about whether or not you need to escalate your therapy to something else. Now, I'm not telling you that every time it happens you're gonna switch. I am telling you that I think it's a best practice to discuss whether you need to switch. Therapeutic inertia bugs the heck out of me. Therapeutic inertia is a phenomenon where we identify that something's medically not okay and yet we don't make a change. And I want people impacted by MS and providers to fight against therapeutic inertia. I want providers to remember that we are shepherds of the brain and spinal cord, the only untransplantable organ system. And as we monitor people with MS on therapy, if we see they have breakthrough disease, we need to act. Now it bears mentioning that if we successfully slow down someone's disease using disease-modifying therapy, and yet they're miserable with nasty symptoms, then we as providers have not done our best job. In order to do our best job, we have to do two things. We have to slow down their disease, and in addition, we have to improve their quality of life by treating symptoms that bother them. And I wanna focus for a few minutes on invisible symptoms. 
So much of MS pathology is invisible to the outside observer. Honey, you look so good. I'm talking about things like cog fog, depression. I'm talking about things like poor energy levels and bladder complaints. And it's my opinion that we need to actively screen people with MS every visit, asking them about their cognition, their mood, their energy levels, and their bladder. And so I think it's a best practice to ask each patient the following series of questions. Number one, how are your energy levels? Good, bad, or ugly? And how is the energy impacting your daily life? Number two, how's your mood? Sad, blue, depressed, crying spells? I also like to say, what would your family say about your mood if they were here to tattle on you? Number three, what do you think of your thinking and memory? How are things going at school or at work or at home as it relates to cognition? And number four, what's your bladder like? Are you having accidents or near accidents? Are you having difficulty getting the urine out? Are you having frequent urinary tract infections? What's going on? I think that asking those important questions, which touch on a lot of so-called invisible symptoms, is one of the best ways to make sure that we don't miss stuff and that we improve the quality of your life. And now to answer the question of the day. How frequently should people with MS have brain MRI scans? The correct answer is number three, annually, once every year. Hey Village, would you be comfortable sharing this video with your MS provider? Please let me know your thoughts down in the section below. And if you do in fact share this video with your provider, I would love to know what they said in response. Make sure to check out the second part in this two-part series. Once that video is made, I'll throw a link to it up above. YouTube Analytics thinks that you would adore this video right there, and so you might want to check that one out as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Just click that circle with my head on it. Go ahead, click my head. My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. So until my next video, or my next live stream, or the next time I see you in clinic, take care.